how good the Lord is. Blessings to each of you. It is Sunday morning once again, and it is the first Sunday. So I want to encourage you to get all that you need for our communion time. Get your wafers, your bread, your crackers, your juice. Let's get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. Also, I want you to get your Bibles and go back with me to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter 37, I want to commence the reading at verse number 29 and go through verse 36. This is the end of chapter 37 of Genesis, and we're still talking about witnessing beyond your wounds. And today I want to specifically talk about when God has his hands on you. Beloved, you have to know this. It does not matter who try, who may try to take you out, who may try and put you in a pit, try to hurt you or harm you because of their hatred for you. When God has his hands on you, he knows how to keep you even in moments when you cannot keep yourself. So I'm excited about worship. I'm excited about sharing the word of God with you. I just want to tell you, thank you so much for continuing to be engaged even in this virtual space. You will never know how grateful to God I am for each of you, but also how God is being glorified by your consistency and your commitment. So look, we're about to have our music ministry to bless us in song. So I want you to join in, worship together. Let's join together in the Lord and worship him in spirit and in truth. Listen, I love you and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. God bless you. Help us sing it this morning, the greatness of the Lord. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows is unconditional. unconditional. The power of the Lord, the of the Lord is, unbeatable. is unbeatable. Great is, great is the God he Come on, help us sing it this morning, the greatness of the Lord. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows. He shows his unconditional. The power of the Lord, of the Lord is, unbeatable. is unbeatable. Great is, great is the God Come on, you should know this already. God is great. God is great. Yeah. And greatly to be praised. And greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. God is great. God is and greatly, to be and greatly to be praised. Come on, put your hands together with us this morning as we sing it. Come on. The greatness of the Lord. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows, love that is, unconditional. He shows is unconditional. The power of the Lord, the power of the Lord is, unbeatable. is unbeatable. Come on, great is. You should have it now. Come on, God. And greatly to be praised. And greatly to be praised. Oh, God is great. God is great. Oh, and greatly to be praised. And greatly to be praised. Come on, get your family with us. Come on, y'all join in. God is great. God is great. Oh, and greatly to be praised. And greatly to be praised. Oh, God is great. God and greatly to be praised. Let's take it up one. Hey, 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 God is great. God is great. Oh, and greatly to be praised. Greatly to be praised. Come on, if you know you serve a great God, sing it with us. God is great. Oh, and greatly to be praised. Greatly to be praised. Come on, let's take it up again. To be praised. Oh, God is great. God is great. Oh, oh, oh. oh and greatly to be praised. Send it up. Hey, hey, God is great. God is great. Hallelujah. And greatly to be praised. And greatly to be praised. Great. 
and greatly to be praised. To be praised. And to be praised. Oh, God is great. God is great. Yes, He is, and greatly to be and praised. Sing it with us. God is great. God is right. Oh, God is great. Yeah. God is right. Last time, that's it. Come on. And greatly to. And greatly to be praised. Come on, if you serve a great God, come on, give him a great praise in this house. Hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Indeed, it's my delight to come before you again, New Mount Olive, to share indeed the goodness of the Lord. The Lord has been good. I want to thank our music ministry for reminding us, reinforcing a very fundamental tenet of our faith. God is great and greatly to be praised. Indeed, our God is great and praise literally becomes the believer. Indeed, we praise the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is our time to praise God in profundity as we prepare our hearts and minds to give unto God. Indeed, giving is a grace expression. Giving is worship. It is our time to worship the Lord as we give unto him that which he has given unto us. The tenth, the tithe, yes, we give the Lord a 10% of our earnings. And then we give the Lord an offering dependent on the deposits that the Lord has given unto us. We release it this morning with cheerful and joyful hearts as we prepare to give. Let's pray together. Father, for the novelty and nobility of this morning, we give you praise indeed. Hearts rife and fraught with thanksgiving. We say thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for all the resources that you provide, the strength that you give us so that we might substantiate life through employment. And God, with that said, we give now unto you the tithe, the tenth, and proportionately we give unto you out of our deposits. We give, God, that which belongs to you already as stewards, Receive our gifts, we pray, to the end that your name be glorified. God, it is our prayer that existentially the kingdom is enlarged. We pray this prayer in the blessed name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We give because we love the Lord and because we believe in kingdom building. Bless the Lord for the gift of giving. Now we prepare our hearts afresh and anew to hear a most powerful and profound prolific word that God will produce for us through our senior pastor as he preaches to us the Joseph narrative, the saga of one who's favored by the Father. Did we excite it? Brace yourself, bracket yourself to hear what the Lord will say to you. It is my prayer that you'll be blessed as you hear the message in Jesus' name. Amen. How good the Lord is. Blessings to you once again. Indeed, we are blessed and we are privileged to have this opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 37, and I want to commence the reading at verse number 29 Genesis 
37, verse number 29, hear the word of God as it speaks to us. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the varied colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please explain. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons... And all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the body God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto our God. We've been talking thematically about witnessing beyond your wounds and want to tag this demonic presentation today when God has his hands on you. When God has his hands on you. Beloved, in this narrative, we have been studying over the last several weeks. It is this young 17-year-old boy, Joseph, who is baby boy of Jacob. Joseph is his father's favored son. Father exhibits this favor by giving his boy this varied colored tunic, which is indicative of the authority and the assignment of the father's expectation of the son. The father exhibits this unique love for his baby boy. And it causes Jacob's other boys to be at odds with their baby brother. The brothers are so indignant with Joseph that they ultimately hate him, hate him so much that they scheme against him because they believe that they need to eradicate him from their circle. So they come up with this scheme, and this scheme they decide that they're going to kill Joseph. Then big brother Reuben suggests perhaps let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into the pit. Brothers corroborated and collaborated together, decided they would throw him into the pit. Throw him in the cistern expecting perhaps he might die, but the blood should not be on their hands. Well, in the midst of them throwing him in the pit, another of the brothers, Judah, says, perhaps let's not allow him to die in the pit. Let's sell him to this caravan of Ishmaelites or Midianites that are coming through. They show up, they extract him from the cistern. They pull him from the pit. They sell him for a few pieces of silver, price, going price of a slave. He's now on his way. The brothers 
sitting, eating after they've thrown him into the pit. Now they have sent him with the caravan. Reuben shows back up. Now, what is unique, and this is where I want to drop my anchor for a few moments this morning, is perhaps when the boys sat away from the pit and were having their lunch, Reuben, being the elder brother with the responsibility of watching the flock a certain way, goes back into the field to check on his father's livestock. As he goes, he's perhaps trying to maybe divert the attention of the brother so that he can come back and rescue his brother. Perhaps his idea seemed noble, yet it was still nefarious. Comes back and he discovers that his brother Joseph is no longer in the pit. He's distraught because Joseph has seemingly disappeared. The brothers try to calm him as he raises the interrogative, where is Joseph? They share with him that we have sold him into slavery. And he's now gone with the caravan. Being that point, the caravan is too far away for Reuben to go and try to track or trace them. So now he tears his clothes, which is indicative of his mourning. Now the question is, why is he upset? Is he upset because the brother has been sold or is he upset because he has the responsibility of communicating the fact that his baby brother Joseph, communicating this fact to his father is no longer with them. So I want to suggest as I share with you this morning when God has his hands on you, uh, you're going to have to deal with people who are careless about you. You will have to deal with people who will conspire against you. You will have to deal with people who are cruel about you. But then you can be blessed because of a God who has care for you. So it is in this text in verse Number 29 and verse 30. The reason I would suggest that you have to deal with people who are careless about you. It is because Reuben tried to figure a plan that maybe he could rescue or perhaps redeem his brothers, his brother from the other brothers. Perhaps I can get them not to kill Joseph, throw him into the pit, come back, extract him, take him back to the father. And maybe Joseph would just see this as a real bad prank from the brothers. So what we see is Reuben's return. Reuben, he returns. Joseph is not there. Joseph is not there. Then we discover Reuben's regret. Reuben regrets that perhaps he should have done more when he had the opportunity. But now we see Reuben's response because what he does is he starts to mourn and he's broken and disappointed because what has happened to his brother. The question is, is he concerned so much that his brother has now been sold into slavery, perhaps never to be seen again? Or is he simply upset in his response because of what he will have to deal with in having to go and tell his father. Because you do know, if you read historically the narrative of Reuben and his father, Reuben slept with his father's concubine, which caused them to have a riff between them. Now, the father probably already figured that Reuben was reckless and irresponsible. And this only compounds the father's thoughts of his older son, Reuben. And Reuben perhaps is knowing that when he goes back and have to tell his father that Joseph is no longer with them, he has this sense of 
concern as to how it will further cause the divide between him and his father. So what it would suggest is Reuben walking away, leaving Joseph with the boys in the pit would suggest people who are careless about you. They lack value for you. It's apparent that Reuben perhaps didn't value Joseph like he ought to have valued him because he knew if his brothers concocted a plan to try to kill him, he convinced them not to kill him and throw him in the pit. He knew he was dealing with some treacherous siblings. He perhaps should have known the brothers that he was dealing with, knowing that they perhaps may try something even greater in his absence. But again, he trusted these treacherous brothers to perhaps leave Joseph in the pit. But Joseph was not left in the pit, but they lacked, he lacked value for him. Careless people have the propensity to lack value for your life. Watch the people in your life who seem as if they are trying to help you, but then they become ghosts. They will ghost you in the process. They will disappear on you in the process. But not only, not only was there a lack of value, but also there was a low view of him. Folks sometimes will have a low view of you, and the reason we notice that because when you watch the text, look at verse number 30, it says this, he returned to his brothers and said, the boy, not my brother, not, not my sibling, but the boy. Perhaps his low view of him suggested, I don't even view him necessarily as my brother, I, 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 can't, I can't say this emphatically, but I do know careless people will oftentimes have a low view of you, and oftentimes it's based upon how they tag you. Be careful of how people tag you. Some folk will call you certain names because they have a low view of you. It seems to me that Reuben not only had a low value for his brother, but perhaps he even had a low value view of him. How are you tagging people that that's in your life? How are you tagging people that's in your circle? How are you tagging people that you perhaps may be connected to? Watch how you tag people, but also pay attention to how people tag you. Just because they seem like they are trying to help you does not always mean they have good intentions in their desire to help you. But watch this. Not only do we see this that people are careless about you but they will conspire against you it is in verses 31 32 and 33 that we see how these brothers are conspiring against their baby brother and ultimately against the father it says so they took joseph's tunic slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood they sent the buried colored tunic and brought it to the father and said, we found this, please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it, said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Well, what we discover in this is that boys were misleading and they were mean misleading to the father and mean to the father. Now, think about it. They had ripped the coat off of the brother. You, you've got to see this. This family has so much drama. If, it, if they were a contemporary family in today, it would have to be the real lives of Jacob and Joseph's family. I, I mean, it, you would have to see. You got Reuben over here trying to concoct a scheme. You have Judah trying to hustle and sell his brother. Then you got the other brothers trying to kill. But if you look back historically in the life of Jacob, Jacob himself had done something very similar to what his sons are doing to him. And what you discover in this is what Jacob has sown. Now Jacob is reaping. You have to be careful, beloved, what you sow, because what you sow 
that you shall reap. Watch, watch this. Let, let me give you a historical perspective of the sinful deed of Jacob. This is what Jacob did. Jacob lied to his father. He lied about his father's favorite son, Esau. He used Yes, yes, a coat of his father's favorite son to help in the deception. And then he killed some goats to, in essence, help accomplish the deed of his deception. Listen, lied to his father, lied about the father's favorite son, and then he used the coat that the father's favorite son had to deceive him. And then he killed some goats to accomplish the deed of deception. That's what Jacob did. Watch what Jacob's sons do to him. They lied to him, their father. They lied about his favorite son, Joseph. They used the coat of his favorite son to help in the deception. And then they killed the goat to help accomplish the deed of deception. Think about that, beloved. What seeds have you sown? And you have to start raising this question when you start looking at harvest time. Jacob is now receiving the harvest of what he has planted. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's foul. I'm not saying it's good. I am saying it is reciprocity. It is the reality. It is him reaping what he has sown. And what you see in these brothers is that there are some people who would do anything misleading or mean. You have to know this story. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse as the narrative progressive progresses. The boys, they, they, they were envious of the brother. They were mad because the father favored him. They disliked him, didn't want to talk to him, didn't want to converse with him, didn't want to have anything to do with him. When he shows up, then they say, let's try to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. Let's kill the dream. Let's kill the dreamer so we can kill the dream. They say, well, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. It keeps getting bad and darker as it progresses. Then they say, well, that Maybe let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. They throw him in the pit. They go have lunch. They say, well, maybe this, the pit is not good enough. Let's sell him off. Let's get rid of him and, and completely get rid of him. And then they sell him off. And now they have to continue these lies of deception to try to keep this going. So now they've drawn the father into what they're doing. So they go and they say, what we need to do is we take this coat that we ripped off of him. And they knew the coat talking about maybe we'll take the coat coat back raising the question to the father do you know whose coat this is they knew whose coat it was and they knew that the father would recognize the coat then you have to think about how tricky they were they didn't fully immerse the coat in the blood they dipped it in the blood enough for it to look as if he he had been devoured by a wild beast they used enough deception to mess the father up you have to know watch those people who are dipping your coat in something to deceive others about you. Some folk, they are dipping your integrity into some blood to try to deceive others about you. Some folk are that dipping your your personality in some blood to try uh, using certain things to try to su- suggest that you are not who you are you're not where you are you're not this or you're not that be careful of the folk that's trying to cause others to look at you in the wrong light cause others to see you in the wrong light i wish i had somebody who would just whisper and let me whisper in the ear so i could tell you stop being so trusting of everybody because they sit at your dinner the table because they call you on the phone because they text message you because they seem so cool with you some folk the moment the first chance they get they'll stab you in the back the first chance they get they'll try and take you out these brothers they wanted to take their brother out and then it seemed as if they wanted to take the father out in the process they knew how their father regarded their brother they knew how the father loved their brother They knew how the father favored their brother. So not only were they indignant against their brother, but they were indignant against their father. Some folk are mad at you, but they can't show out on you. So they really, they can't show out on the father, so they show out on you. But in essence, they're not only upset with you, but they're upset with the father. Some folk, they are mad at God for how he is prospering your life. 
Some folk are mad at God at how he's blessing your life. So they'll try to take you out and then they want to mislead the father because they really want the father to think that they care. That's why I say some folk will be cruel about you. It's in the text, verse 34 and 35. Listen to what it says. As you read the text, verse 34, the script says, So Jacob tore his clothes, sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. In fact, about 20 plus years, he struggled with the loss of Joseph. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he says, surely. I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. I find it, I find it oddly strange that this, these brothers who had schemed against their brother, so much so to the point that they had him sold into slavery, then sought to deceive the father to make the father believe that the boy had been devoured by a wild beast. So much so that the father looked at the tunic, looked at the blood, because he had no way to do any kind of DNA test. He couldn't couldn't do any blood test to check for blood samples. He had to take it at face value. Yes, my boy is gone. And, And then here comes these brothers attempting to be sad with the father about the brother's loss when in actuality they knew exactly what had happened to the brother. You ever, you ever, watch, you ever watch some of these documentaries, these folk, they kill somebody, then they join the search party, and they are acting like they're looking, and they know exactly where the person is, but they're looking and posting signs just like anybody else. That's how these brothers were. They knew exactly what had happened, but then they show up. And let me use a contemporary analogy. They show up to the funeral like Q did in that movie, like they didn't know what had happened. And they knew in the movie Juice at the, at the mother's house, acting like they didn't know what happened to the woman's son. And they were part of what caused the boy to die. Some folk, they will be a part of your demise and then get with the group and act like they're sad for your downfall. You have to watch folk like that. These boys knew, they plotted, they planned. They were part of the boys' downfall. They were part of trying to take Joseph out. Go back to their father and have the audacity to exhibit false concern and false care. Can you see them? Daddy, it's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Lord, we don't, we don't know. We, he was out there there with us and we turned and before we knew it he was gone you low down dirty rascals they were some rascals of rascality can you imagine they knew exactly what had happened to their brother they tried to take him out and then go to their father and act like they were concerned have you ever met anybody like that act like they care about what has happened to you after it has happened to you when they were a part of making what happened to you happen to you. Well, I got good news. The good news is God still cares for you. In as much as these brothers were careless, in as much as they were conspirators and co conspirators as much as they were cruel God still had his hands on Joseph let me tell you something that that ought to make you shout right there in the sense that it doesn't matter how low people may go and try to take you down or take you out they can't do anything when God has his hands on you it may look bad it may look bleak it may look dark but when God has his hands on you God knows how to care about you God will see about you and God will save you what we see in the text is we see the providence of God we also see the protection of of God and we see the positioning 
of God. Watch what the text says in verse number 36. It says, meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Looks, looks bad back when Joseph came down through Shechem. It looked bad when Joseph got to Dothan and his brother said, here comes the dreamer. And it looked bad when the brothers started to plot against their baby brother. It looked bad when the brothers started to figure out maybe we'll take him out. It looked bad when the brothers started to plan how they would take him out. The boy said, how about we come together and kill him? The story looked bad for Joseph because it seems as if Joseph, you've been favored by the father. Joseph, yes, you have a future because of the father. Joseph, it, it seems like all that is planned for you. Yes, Lord, is being plotted to take you out. And it seemed like now the same boy who was walking in favor. Yes, Lord, it seemed like the same boy who was walking with a positive future. It looks like he's not going to make it to where the father has designed for him to go because he has some treacherous and tricky brothers who now have planned to kill him and take him out. But then you see the hand of God still in the situation because when the boys figured we could kill him, God moved on the altar of Reuben's heart because I believe Reuben could never have shown up on the scene and said, wait a minute, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. Oh, oh. And then when Reuben showed up and said, let's throw him in the pit and the boys all agree, that to me is a God with his hands uh, on Joseph's life. Um, whoa. And when uh, they threw him in the pit, um, start eating their lunch, um, here comes Judah saying, uh, maybe let's just sell him into slavery. Um, it seemed like um, the story for Joseph's life uh, is going darker and darker. But I see the hand uh, of the Lord uh, on his life um, when they sold him um, I can hear in my spiritual imagination um, God simply saying uh, I've got to take you through some stuff um, I've got to take you around some stuff um, to get you right where I want you to be um, and uh, when the media nights um, and these Israelites um, got Joseph um, to Egypt the Bible says uh, they sold him up to Potiphar and Potiphar was a part of a Pharaoh's circle and now you understand that the Pharaoh is at the top of the hierarchy chain simply showing us that God was saving Joseph for a sacred assignment because he had a seat prepared for him come here somebody let me encourage you right now you may be suffering um, you may be going through some hard time uh, but hold uh, hold on uh, I want to tell you God uh, has plans for your life uh, if I could uh, just fast forward uh, to 
chapter 50 of Genesis and just give you a sneak peek into what God was doing. The same boy that was sold out by his brothers, the same boy that was, uh, uh, yes, uh, in a scheme uh, to be killed by his brothers, uh, the same boy that the boys tried uh, to take him out, uh, God uh, had his hands on his life, uh, when God uh, had his hands on, shucks, uh, oh, uh, when God uh, had his hands on your life, uh, no devil in hell uh, can stop your future, uh, when God uh, had Shucks, shucks fire. Oh, Lord, when God has his hands on your life, you can go through the fire and you won't get burned. When God has his hands on your life, you can go through the flood and still not drown. When God has his hands on your life, tears will fall, but he'll hold you. When God has his hands on your life, cancer can't get you. High blood pressure can't take you. COVID can't do anymore. Shucks up than God wanted to do. When God has his hands on your life, it doesn't matter who comes against you. God will take care of you. So I want you to just hug yourself and encourage yourself uh, on this first Sunday morning uh, just hug yourself uh, and say self uh, we've been through uh, some hard times uh, say self uh, we've had uh, some difficult days uh, they tried uh, to take us out uh, but just talk to yourself uh, even if you're in the house by yourself just talk to yourself just hug yourself don't worry about it don't worry. even if you got folk in the house I want you to take this moment talk to yourself. Say, self, uh, I should have been uh, dead and gone. Uh, come on, just talk to yourself for me. Say, self, uh, but I saw some hand um, on my life uh, holding, uh, holding me. Uh, yes! Yes, sir. Uh, yes! Shucks. Hey! Yes, uh, thank God um, for his hands. Um, thank God uh, for his saving power. Um, thank God uh, for his keeping power. Thank God. Uh, Shucks him for his protecting power. You ought to just say it uh, right there by yourself. Uh, can't nobody. Can't nobody. Shucks. Uh, can't nobody do me like Jesus. No, nobody can do me like Jesus. He'll save you in the midst of mess. He'll keep you in the midst of chaos. He'll hold you when folk try to harm you. He'll guide you when folk try to mislead you. He'll lift you up when folk try to put you down. He'll mend you when folk try to break you. You want to say to yourself, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Is there anybody here can say, can't nobody? God, we say thank you. Even in the midst schemes and plots plans to try and take us out thank you God for your hands may not can see them but we can experience the saving power of your hand for that God we say thank you God we pray now for the person perhaps They've gone through a crisis like Joseph has gone through. People scheming, people plotting, people trying to take them out. Yet, you've kept them. God, I pray now for that person, man, woman, boy, or girl, who does not know you as Lord and Savior. At this moment, God, 
they would recognize their need for you. Test their heart. They would give themselves to you right now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for the person who's gone through so much that they literally felt the only option that was viable was for them to walk away and give up and throw in the towel. But today you're saying you are a God of another chance. Gracious God, I pray for the person who's looking for a church, even in the pandemic, to be connected so that they can grow in you. God, we pray for peace with their decision. It is in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we offer this prayer. And every child of God said, Amen. If you would like to connect, we invite you to follow the promptings on the screen. Wherever you are geographically, you can still be a part of the New Mount Island Baptist Church. We invite you to join even at this moment right now. As you watch the screen, as you listen to the voice on the teleconference prompting you. But most of all, as God prompts you. Perhaps you want to contribute and share the voice on the teleconference and the screen. It's prompting you as to what to do. But most of all, let God prompt your heart. We just want you to be a part of what God is doing here at the New Mount, New Mount Olive Baptist Church. Now, beloved, this is the first Sunday, and God has blessed us to reach the second first Sunday of the year. And this is when we celebrate the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Every time we come to this table, we're reminded of the selfless sacrifice of our Savior to secure our salvation. When we come to this table, we come to this table thanking God for loving us in spite of us. Loving us like no one else could love us. Loving us in ways unimaginable. Let us pray. God, we say thank you. Thank you for this moment that you have afforded us to come to this table to tell you thank you. Thank you for this moment that you've allowed us to come to this table to remember the sacrifice, the suffering, the life that you shared for us in order to save us. God, help us to never take casually nor lightly this moment, but reverently and responsibly remember you. God, we thank you for who you are, and we bless your wonderful name. We do now offer this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and every child of God said, Amen. Let us join together for our communion moment. Again, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So blessed we've been to hear the word of the Lord through our senior pastor. And indeed, we come now to a very sacred moment in our faith. We gather together at the table of the Lord. Indeed, it is a table of remembrance. It's a table of fellowship. And moreover, it's a table of communion. We've come to remember our Lord and all that he has done to and his atoning work for our salvific hope. We thank him, we praise him for the sacrifice that he gave indeed for our sin. He died on the cross and we praise him as we look reflectively. We praise him for dying and indeed buried but raised on the third day. We look within, it is our time of introspection indeed we examine our hearts as the Apostle Paul declares. We confess our sins before a holy God. We look forward. It is Jesus who simply says, this do in remembrance of me until I come again. And indeed, it is our hope. It is our expectation that our Lord will come again. So we eat together as we've gathered. You have now your elements Whatever your elements are, we partake together. We partake of the bread, which represents 
symbolic of his body, we eat together. The fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We drink together. Bless the Lord for this day, and indeed, we glorify his name for the gift of his salvation. We prepare now collectively, communally, for our witnessing declaration. As always, we look forward as we depart from this time shared together to witnessing the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Together, we prepare our hearts and minds now to declare together, indeed, we declare proudly. We, the New Mount Olive Baptist Church, are sent out to witness the gospel as we worship the Lord in the world. This is our declaration indeed. This is our charge as we depart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.